And we are back for another fun-filled episode of Pop Goes the Zebra, Jeremy the Ref, Jesse the Ref, and we are joined by a very special guest today, uh, a good friend of the of uh, of ours from the wrestling world. Uh, you know him from WWE. He's now out there on the independents killing it. The one, the only, Simon Gotch. Simon, how you doing? Oh, wonderful. If there was a second one of me, they probably would have fired him too. <laughs> I was going to say, well, I'm sure it'd be for budgetary reasons, of course, you know. Oh, no, I was specifically told I was fired because Vince felt my character had gone its course. So I think I'm the only one that's ever been told that. Well, I think because I am, I'm, if nothing else, a unique individual in that regard. Look, man, how can you fire somebody with a mustache like that? That's what I'm saying. That freaking mustache. I'm well, I mean, technically, he fired like three people with mustaches like that, but that's another story altogether. That's. <laughs> <laughs> there but uh <laughs> we were having a ball uh before we hit the record button just talking all things li literature and video games and it was it was so hard to find a way to say we gotta stop so we can hit the record button and do this so we're, we're we were talking about uh first we were talking about video games and it kind of led into uh other other facets of, of literature and and how movies have have taken a turn for the worse um and uh and why that is uh we were talking specifically about titanic uh yes you were you were saying you know it, it's not that it's badly written or poorly acted there's just something about it that just doesn't work continue on that there, there is it, there, there's a very like i said it's a very numb feeling it, it's it's like when you eat a meal that isn't you know it's not poorly cooked right. but you just know you it does it, something's off and you can't put your finger on it. i think it's the difference between being shall we say well educated on the subject of cinema and being a viewer of cinema i think this is a like there's an old cliche that i despise it's um i might not be a chef but i know if my food tastes like shit precisely beyond that being a very low bar to clear if you, if you literally take two piles and go okay which one is food and which one is shit and someone has to really think about it. That's a very low bar to clear. Um, but moreover, it's like you might not enjoy the meal. But first and foremost, we need to establish what your palate is. We need to understand, like, if you think the height of culinary excellence is McDonald's, then I can safely say your opinion on food does not fucking matter. There's no sane person who's going to say, well, that guy said it was a terrible meal. And I mean, he thinks, you know, the McDouble is the tastiest thing in human existence. So clearly we should be listening to him. It's, but it's, it's just a reoccurring issue. But in, in many cases, the difference between education, understanding, and, and simply being a, a observer is the why, knowing the why and being able to figure out the why. Like, I can't necessarily put my finger on why I don't like Titanic, but I watch it and it feels off. Then there are some movies that I can point to why I like them, and I can specifically point to why they appeal to me. Uh, I, I always use Summer of 1984 as an example because... It appeals to me on a nostalgic level because I appreciate that it's a sort of visual reference to stuff like The Goonies and Rear Window and all these sort of 80s movies with this sort of, with this classic you know setup of you know is this guy a killer is he a normal person but what I really love about the film is that the last 20 minutes is just a continual repeated punch in the chest where every time you try to get a breath the movie just hits you harder and harder and harder until one of the most unsettling endings I've ever seen is, is done. And it's not even the most brutal thing they could have done, like visually speaking, but where it leaves the characters emotionally is so fucked up. And so it, 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 it's very effective in what it wants, but it takes you from this nostalgic fun trip to shit just got real and real is very ugly. Um, and I feel like some, some like Titanic that fails to affect me in the same way, even if I don't know why. Um, there was a movie a couple of years back that everybody kind of raved about. It didn't come out during a time where your, your, your blockbusters of the world come out. Uh, it, it was uh, the Joker movie with, uh, with Joaquin Phoenix. I would like to hear your opinion on that because a lot of people... Fucking hated it. You hated it. Talk, talk to me about it. Fucking hated it. It, I hated the Joker for one very clear reason, and this is not one where I'm unsure. Like, beyond the fact that it's basically just, they went, hey, you know that movie King of Comedy? What if we did that with the Joker? Which almost feels weird because they used De Niro 
and Martin Scorsese was producer on the film. <laughs> it's be like, it's like Martin Scorsese wanted to remake one of his movies, but he didn't want to actually remake it. So he's like, oh, well, I won't do a remake. I'll just do sort of like, you just do what my what I did, but with this guy. There's some but what bothered me, <laughs> yeah, the ending bothered me because I despise the unreliable narrator as a, as a crutch for any storyteller. When you tell a story and the very end of the story is, but what if none of that happened? You don't know, do you? Yeah. It's such a cheap shit way to get out of it of any lapse in logic or and any mistakes, anything that doesn't make sense is just to go, oh, well, it's the, uh, what is it? Xena Warrior Princess at Comic-Con in The Simpsons. <laughs> Anytime something happened that you noticed that didn't make any sense, a wizard did it. Uh, yeah. So anytime there's a there's a point in the, in the Joker where it doesn't make any sense or where there's some sort of, did any of this really happen? Was this all in Arthur's head? Hmm. I just feel like it's a very cheap way to write a story because you avoid taking responsibility or, or committing to what's going on. When you see a batshit crazy movie, um, like people make fun of Nicolas Cage, but Nicolas Cage gives 150% to every role, no matter how absurd the role is. If you want him to be Ghost Rider, he gives 150% to being Ghost Rider. It doesn't matter if it's a stupid movie. He doesn't give a shit. He's like, no, you, you paid Nicolas Cage to do Nicolas Cage things, and Nicolas Cage is going to do Nicolas Cage things. You're not going to get... You don't get 50% Nicolas Cage. You get 100% Nicolas Cage. I admit I'm guilty of just being a sucker for watching him say, I'm going to steal the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> and it seems goofy, but he did not treat it like such. No, he was 100% to it, man. Yep. And that's the struggle, I think, for a lot. Of, but I think I think that's really the, uh, the reason why I didn't like Joker was it came back to this idea of if he is crazy and if we establish that some of these things may have happened, they may not have happened, then we're, ma we're you're basically wasting my time because the there's going to be no payoff if that's the end of the movie. Like even something like uh, the Usual Suspects, where you could argue there's that same aspect of the unreliable narrator, but there's a difference between I'm a crazy person and I don't know what's really going on, and I'm a liar and I'm lying specifically, and the lie, the big reveal of the lie, is what the actual payoff is. Hmm. Because the the payoff of that movie is him getting away. And the realization that was Kaiser Soze the whole time. I'm sorry if I spoiled the 25 year old movie for anyone. Yeah. They're almost 30 years old. That movie came out, I think, 95, 96. Just, just yeah. don't spoil the end of The Empire Strikes Back. The nerds will rage. <laughs> they get saved by little bears. Okay. Little that's bears. the end of the movie. <laughs> the little teddy bears come and save them the next movie. That's the end of it. That's, that's the. <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh, Another one that comes to mind, and um, this is more, uh, this is a TV show. Everybody was into it at first, and I can actually pick the point where, where like, everybody bailed. It's uh, The Walking Dead. Everybody was, like, so on board with that show when it first came out. It was, you know, it was the because it was, like, that moralistic thing of, you know, if you were put in that position, could you do what they did for the betterment of the group, et cetera, et cetera. And I can almost pinpoint the minute that, spoiler alert, when Glenn got killed by Megan in whatever mm -hmm. season it was, everybody and their mother shit their pants and rioted because, oh my God, my favorite character died. And I'm just like, there were following the comic? material. Now, yeah. That wasn't exactly where Glenn died. Glenn was supposed to die earlier in the timeline and they held it on longer, but he was still supposed to die. So like when you're talking about writing, like, you know, are the fans warranted in their, in their feelings of that? Or are they just kind of thin skin and, oh no, my favorite died. I'm upset now. I'm boycotting, you know? I, I think, I think you cannot create art by committee. David Bowie has a quote about it. Um, I'd have to look up the precise wording, but he basically says, never play to the gallery. It, you need to create something that you are, as an artist, confident in and you believe in. And if you believe that's where the story should go, if Robert Kirkman wrote that and said, this is where I want the story to go, this is what I want to happen, this is how I want the story to proceed from there, that's his business. If you don't like it, you're free to check out at any time. But I, I think for me, the, the thing that made me check out A Walking Dead um, was ultimately they we wound up getting to the point where and it's pro the problem that came up in the comic book as well you're not going to cure the disease if you're not curing it and you're not just ending the story on your own terms then we're never we're going to get into a never-ending cycle of they go somewhere they establish uh, a base camp 
Eventually, there's some sort of conflict from without or within. There's a huge zombie fight. They move on. They find a new place. R cycle, rinse, repeat. Like, that's what it becomes. And that's kind of where the series had gone, because it starts out with the initial camp, then trying to get the CDC. Then it becomes the camp with uh, Herschel and the farm. Yeah. Then, then, uh, and, and just over, and then it becomes the prison. The and then it becomes, uh, yeah, and it's over and over again, it was the same thing. And I think at a certain point, you can only redo that story. And realistically, that is what would happen. You would just sort of have to keep moving until you find a, a place. And I think the smart thing to do would have been to just end the series on their own terms earlier. I don't think they should have. I, I guess they killed Rick. I didn't even get that far. I guess they killed Rick. Like they killed him, but then I'm hearing like they're going to do like a movie or something and he's back and he didn't really die. Like they're they're kind of retconning potentially. Yeah. I, 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 I checked out at season six, so... Yeah, that's about when I think most people like between six and seven. Like I, I didn't even realize it was still on at this point. Yeah, it's but I, I, and apparently Negan's like kicking ass is like the strong character, but I'm just like, why? I'm like because I, went to this. You, you can't you can't you can't placate everybody. I, I think there's nothing wrong with telling the story you want to tell. I think the problem is very often we've because we've given every audience member a voice. We forgot that the whole point of an audience is they're not they're supposed to have one sound. They're supposed Cheer to be or not telling you, you know, what the story should be. Yeah. I I have no objection to Doctor Who being played by a woman. I have no objection to being a person of color. I have no objection to being American. Well, maybe an American. I have a little objection to that. That'd be weird. They still have to be British. Yeah. yeah. But I think the second the audience demands it, you can't do it because if you do it, then they're just gonna demand more. And we see this in wrestling a lot. We think we have to placate them 100% of the time. But I think if you're telling a story that's long term, you can't just say, you want, like, I'm almost of the mind, if you tell me you want something, I can't do it now. I don't know if you are you familiar with, uh, I, I think it was, it was an interview, actually, Robert Kirkman, the guy who did The Walking Dead, they asked him if he was familiar, if he read any of Max Brooks's work. Uh, Max Brooks is the son of Mel Brooks, and he's also the writer of uh, the Zombie Survival Guide, World War Z, a lot of those early sort of okay. zombie revival I'm books. I'm not familiar with this particular interview, though. But they asked him if he if he ever read any of Max Brooks's work, and his response was no. But that's not a knock on Max. I don't do it because I if I ever have an idea for The Walking Dead, I don't want to have it in the back of my mind that I may have stolen it from him. Ah. If I don't read his stuff, I know I didn't steal it. I may have had a similar idea, but I know it didn't come from reading his book and it being in the back of my brain, and then me thinking, "Hey, you know, it'd be cool. What if this happened?" and not realizing I was stealing it because that does happen. I remember years ago and uh, thinking it would be cool to counter a hip toss with the DDT and that I was so innovative to think of that. And then I saw Tommy Dreamer do it on a tape that I'd watched probably a hundred times. <laughs> and I went, oh, shit. Subliminal messages. I, <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, stuff gets lodged in your brain. You remember it. You don't actually remember the source. You just know it came up. And, But I, I think that's very important when you create art. You have to be committed to your vision and it has to be a long-term vision. You can't say, this isn't working today. So we abandon. Otherwise, nothing gets built if you if you stop building at the first sign of, of rain. You're from Chicago. What's one of the two seasons? Construction season and rainy season? Oh, that too. Yeah. Well, Old colder and construction. <laughs> yeah, but, but it's like that's the idea is that you, you can't just go, we're going to stop building because the weather's a little rough right now. It's like, no, you have to keep building and building and building. And there are shows that generally don't find an audience for years. I mean, Firefly found a better audience 20 years after it was canceled than it did when it was actually on. That was weird. Like all of a sudden everybody was on, on the Firefly show. I was like, didn't that get canceled because nobody cared? <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of the, the weird issue. I mean, Chappelle's show was the, a game changer from a, the standpoint that it was, the first, it was the biggest selling DVD of all time for a while. I think I've got season two somewhere in my closet. <laughs> but that was what shifted. That was when a lot of uh, television companies started realizing that maybe ratings weren't giving them an accurate view of who was watching because that was what led to, they released uh, the Stewie Griffin story, whatever it was, the Family Guy thing on DVD, but they hadn't, they never aired it. They saw the numbers on that and realized people actually did like Family Guy and were willing to pay money for it. So they brought the show back. And there were multiple examples that were, people realized that maybe we didn't actually know where our audience was or our audience hadn't found our product yet. And when they finally did, there was, there was money to be made and they got what they wanted, but it, it just, 
it's fascinating that people will bail on an idea so quick because they think that every second should be people out of their seats screaming and not the long-term impact of something. So we're just going to, we've got ourselves a good theme here. So we're going to move on to another, we're just going to talk about it. Another show that everybody was on and then that one thing happened and everybody bailed and they got upset about Game of Thrones. I did not watch it. You have not watched it? Nope. Neither one of us watched it, I guess. Oh, wow. I've seen, I've seen random episodes, but I've never watched the full show. Yep. Okay. So th- that completely blew a hole in the tire of my thought process because I wanted to hit, <laughs> hit you with, with how I would have ended it because I felt it was the logical end point of the show. I contend it ended perfectly. And I can explain that very quickly. I can ex- you want to know why it ended perfectly? Why is that? It was, it was the greatest Chekhov's gun ever pulled off. Explain. Okay. Okay. What happens... Uh, or okay, let's let's start with who is the king at the end? Who sits on the Iron Throne? Let's it, spoil this. It was Bran Stark. The, Bran Stark. What happens to Bran Stark in the very first episode of the series? He gets thrown off the top of the tower, and he gets paralyzed. Right? He gets crippled. Meaning he's going to need to be in a chair for the rest of his life. Story about guy who needs to be. Oh. Or story about a chair. <laughs> Ends with a guy who got put in a chair for life at the beginning of the series, and then he gets the chair. That's perfect. That is the perfect ending. Like, that is the perfect way. They literally went, we're going to push this kid out of the window, paralyze him. The whole time, everyone's going to want to get a chair. And then at the very end, we're going to give the chair to the guy who needs the chair the most. I'll give him the chair. Well, like, all right. So, like, my thought, I took a different train of thought. Now, I'm going to throw this in front of the group just to see what they think. Um, the whole time, the whole arc of the in the background of everything is this this evil army of the dead is coming for for everybody south of the wall, and they're too busy, you know, fighting amongst themselves, you know, territorial pissing match. My thought was the last shot of the series should be just like a pan out, like like you zoom in on the Night King, the leader of the dead army, and then you pan yeah. out and he's sitting on the Iron Throne, and as you pull out. There's just more and more and more of your favorites that have turned. And because they could not get over their petty bullshit, this outside factor that nobody was even paying attention to just came in and wiped everyone out. Because the story the whole time was that the show did not give a fuck about your, your favorite characters, what your moral compass was. Good people died. Bad people lived. Good people did bad things. Bad people did good things. But like it, I felt it would have fit the narrative of the show that well, of course the bad guy wins in the end because the good guys couldn't get their shit together. That was my thought. Yeah, I, I, yeah. that probably would have been the better ending. But I, like I said, I don't know that much about it to really have a dog in that fight. Like I know I caught bits and pieces of the seasons when my roommate was watching it. And I was like, eh, I just keep going. It just wasn't my thing. I enjoyed it until they ran out of source material. Yeah. When they well, it, 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 which again is the problem when trying to adapt the series that hasn't ended yet. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's that's on George. <laughs> yeah. Hey, if anything, that's on the guys making the show. They shouldn't have started it until the series was over. I, I, I think if I'm being honest, I think they thought that by the time they got to that point, the next book would have been, been out and they could have at least had one more season to wrap it all up. And they got there and they're like, so George, where's the book? He's like, well, I finished chapter five about a month ago. Haven't picked it up since, you know. <laughs> they, they clearly do not understand. It can take a while to write a book and he's not a fast writer in the first place. Like, I think it's like, six years between two of the store two of the books at one point like that was like the shortest break and the books are thicker than a good cheeseburger like they aren't exactly yeah. pop-up books yeah no no they're not but that's kind of that's kind of the thing is like if you're expecting him to do it quickly that that's just that's a fool's errand I, and really that's on them that's I, I can't even be mad at george rr R. martin for that one that's like they that really should have known better you, you don't rush filet nope no oh man so when we first got on here, we were talking about video games. Uh, you were talking about Red Dead Redemption. Uh, have you played all of them? Have you only played two? Where Where are you at on so, that? So I never played Red Dead Revolver. Um, 
I had actually played the Undead Nightmare DLC when they released that as a standalone for a Red Dead Redemption. And while I didn't play the actual full game of Red Dead Redemption, I'm familiar with the, with the story and how it ends. So I did think it was an additional, uh, there, there's an additional emotional punch at the end of uh, Red 2. But uh, yeah, that's, so that's where I'm at. I just cleared part two, which is essentially the prequel to the, uh, the first game. Nice. Uh, I have not played the uh, the first game. I I honestly just haven't gotten around to downloading it, and I still haven't finished too. I'm sitting there. I know I'm at the end. I just I just get so like it, it happens sometimes. Side quests, you know, and then I'll start playing another game, and you know, life happens. So like, are are you? Would you consider yourself a, a heavy gamer? Are you a casual gamer? Where do you fall on that? I, I don't use the term. I tend not to label myself with stuff like that. Like I, I play video games. I enjoy them, but it's not a social thing for me. It's something I do for myself. I, I, it's weird because I'll sometimes go off on why I find it so laughable when people talk about uh, the concept of gatekeeping. Because usually what they're actually talking about is harassment. And it's like, they're two different things. They'll say, oh, well, you're, that's gatekeeping. I'm like, look, man, it's a video game sold in at major retailers. I can't gatekeep it. You can go fucking buy it yourself. All I can do is refuse to give you access to my personal contact and maybe my small group of friends. But even then, if we're doing that, we're probably assholes and you don't want to have anything to do with us anyway. So I'm really sparing you. I'm not like robbing you of an experience. Like if I... <laughs> You might be, you might not be old enough to remember this, or you might not have been in these circles when it was happening. But do you remember like mid two thousands when they had the uh, like No Mercy ROM hacks on, uh, like uh, they had ROM hacks of WWF No Mercy that were available on these message boards, where it had like the Ring of Honor roster or the uh, New yep. Japan roster, like all sorts of like indie roster, but. Uh, in order to get the game, you actually had to be an active member of the board. That's gatekeeping because you literally, unless you're allowed into the board and you are allowed, you're an active member, you're not allowed to use the game. That's gatekeeping. And ultimately, that's you can argue if that's good or bad, but it's like they worked on it. It's their game. They're free to distribute it to who they want to. Yeah. But again, when we're talking about something that's freely available, I can't gatekeep pro wrestling. I can't gatekeep Star Wars fandom. I can't gatekeep anything that's in the public arena because you have free access to it i can only gatekeep myself i can only prevent you from accessing me and again if i'm a jerk and i don't want to talk to you why why would you ignore my my right to consent and try to force like oh no you have to talk to me because i like this too i don't fucking care bro i don't care if you also like this thing i like i don't want to fucking talk to you but that's why i don't online game that's why i stay to myself but in the same way, I don't. I stopped eating meat like three years, almost three years ago. Really? I don't call myself a vegan or a vegetarian. Yeah, don't refer to myself as one because it's not a moral stance. Just didn't it, I have no. Oh no! I had a. I shat blood one day and it freaked me out. So I figured I'd try and get my my stomach back in. Yeah, no, trust me. There's all the injuries I've had. Shitting blood is the most intense and frightening one. You uh, you <laughs> told that story whenever you were at Crux. Yeah, you told us that story. I was like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> yeah, but that was why I stopped eating meat. But I'm I have no moral issue with it. I even and there are plenty of good reasons ethically, you know, environmentally to not eat meat. I just don't. That's not why I do it. So I don't call myself as I don't label myself a vegetarian or a vegan or anything because I have no. I'll eat meat if that's the only choice. It's just rarely the only choice. Gotcha. Yeah. Um. I, for the longest time, I was I was more of like the story driven gamer. Like I liked like the Metal Gear Solids, you know, Final Fantasy things where it was telling me a story and I was going along for the ride. Mm -hmm. And eventually, like my friends kind of just got me into playing things like Call of Duty, things that you can all do together, things like that. But I find myself uh, missing the days where like I could sit down and just play a game that just had like a like a hundred hour story or something and and. Mm -hmm. just get immersed into it and i think those games have gone by the wayside now and that's why i'm just not as satisfied as as a video gamer anymore is because everything is about online and the the in-game yep. purchases that go with it you can definitely still find them um but they are getting it, it, it's a bit more of a quest i was an early adapter to the uh ryuga gotoku series uh yakuza 
Uh-huh. Oh, like I had like back on the PS2, I had the Yakuza one and two. Uh, when I got a PS3, that was my first purchase was Yakuza uh, three, four, and five was getting those. Um, but those again, those games are getting harder and harder to find. But you have to look. I, like, I have, you have to search them out. I, and I feel like the problem though is if you find them, like the the effort in the development of those games aren't there like they used to because all the resources that were put in developing that game were shifted over to well we got to put out call of duty 5006 and make sure that all the downloadable content is ready to go by this quarter that quarter and the other so it's like i'm even afraid to find those 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 off the beaten track games anymore sometimes you just have to take the chance with it because there's not a whole lot else again or just stop playing or or stick to classic games like the next one I'm, i'm excited for the new saints row game i have I don't know when we're getting it, but it's yeah, that's a that's a series oh, I'm yeah. not into yet. But I keep meaning like I have a list of like oh it's oh Saints Row is awesome and Far Cry and just like all that you know. I gave up on Far Cry because the first game was a weird sci-fi game, and then all the rest of them have just sort of been like, hey, we're going to drop you in a war-torn country in like North Africa. Have fun. Yeah, because there's not like a thousand games just like that scenario already, you know. Yeah, it's I. Again, I like FSP. I don't mind FSPs. I just feel like they have a very limited interest level for me. I would rather play a third-person game with a first-person shooting mechanic than I would play just a straight first-person shooter. It took me a yeah. minute to get used to that over-the-shoulder camera. I remember the first time I remember uh, encountering that was probably with uh, Resident Evil Four. I'm wanting to say, yeah. and and then when they kind of went back and started redoing those games, like. For some of those games, it was a breath of fresh air, like the the remake of two, which I love, which I was not a fan of the original two. I was a three fan. Like in my head, I made this like line in the sand of, you know, no, I'm a fan of this, so I can't be a fan of that. No, I'm a three guy, you know, but that second one came out and like (coughs) that scared the crap out of me because, you know, the tyrant, you can hear him stomping around the building and just like that constant, uh, you know, flow of adrenaline and and anxiety because of it just really drew me into the game. I knew the story, but I was still terrified, even though I knew everything the game had to throw at me. It was weird. And uh, I I mean, like, where do you, and speaking of of redos and remakes, things like that, where do you stand on, on like the remakes and retellings of those games? Like, uh, Final Fantasy VII is going through that right now. A lot of people are excited about that. You know, like where do you fall on the on the spectrum of of them going back to the classics from like PS One era and bringing them into the modern graphics? Well, I, I'm actually okay with it. Um, part of the reason it doesn't bother me is because one of my favorite games of all time was uh, Lunar Two on the Sega CD. Oh yeah. Now we're going old. And. <laughs> oh yeah, and one of my I was super excited when they actually an, update, an updated version uh, for the PS uh, PS One, and I don't think it's a bad thing. I, I, the way the one of the creators actually there's a, there's when you got the the special edition big box of uh, for Lunar Two, there's like a a DVD movie ROM in it where you could like watch the making of the game, and they interviewed one of the creators and he said I, I think of it like a story which is Mr. Sega CD told the story one way, but Mr. Sega CD was very old and didn't have a very good memory and would forget certain things. <laughs> then Mr. Saturn told the story differently, but he knew more about it and remember better. But Mr. PlayStation remembers the most and he knows the full story. Ah, I, So I, I think there's nothing, I think there's definitely, uh, as, as much as he has been maligned in recent years, George Lucas said something uh, about filmmaking he said movies don't get finished they get given up on Mm -hmm. and the the idea is that with infinite money and infinite time no director would ever be satisfied with their film they would and they would work for all of eternity and spend every nickel of infinite money just to make the film perfectly as it is in their head uh on screen and i think that the plus side of like it's hard to do that with movies because obviously actors age and die performance styles change, uh, technology changes. But with video games, you really do have the opportunity to remake them and retell them. And it's not that big a deal because the improvements are visible. The gameplay can improve. The combat system can be improved. Like there's no, there's no video game I've ever played that I didn't think could eventually be improved. 
even if it's just from the visual standpoint. But movies in some cases are so perfect when they're made because the experience of seeing it and its emotional connection that any changes are bad. Like they're, they're, I think it's why so many remakes fall flat is because they literally just aren't the original. It doesn't matter if the special effects are better. It doesn't matter if the writing is better. Like you, it's, it's why it's so rare to see a remake where you say it's better than the original because you almost have to have no connection to the original to appreciate the remake, which means remaking it was pointless because they just needed a similar movie, not that movie. And I, th- I think that's why I, like, I mentioned, like, I was, I wasn't a fan of original Resident Evil 2, but was a fan of the remake. I was, I was a huge fan of the first Nemesis, but like, I got so excited when I heard they were remaking that game. And I was like, dude, I cannot wait to kick this dude's ass in, in high death. And I got into that game and within like a half hour, I knew I was in trouble because they had neutered everything that I loved about that game from 20 years ago. It, it wasn't that they tried to improve it. It's like they just did. All right. So here's this part, this part and this part. And we're just going to put a new coat of paint on it, but we're not going to improve it in any way. And in fact, we're going to take some things out, which just makes it almost cut and paste meat and potatoes easy. You know, and so I think to your point, you know, sometimes it just it it just doesn't work because it's done for all the wrong reasons. Yeah, yeah it doesn't it doesn't add anything to the experience. Um, I, it's my understanding that the new uh, Final Fantasy VII that they released, they actually go to a uh, action RPG style of combat system instead of the traditional turn based. Correct. Yeah, it, you can free flow through the characters uh, during combat. You can jump from any of the three in the fight up to th- three people in the fight. You, you know, you're not sitting there with the, all right, do you want to attack? Do you want to defend? Do you want to use magic yeah. as item? Uh, that's all at, at the tip of your, of, of your, of your controller. And it, but the challenge is you have to, like, you just have your basic, you know, if you're Cloud, you just have your basic sword attack, which will build up, like, like your action bar to where you can do something of note. But you can only, you know, you, know, you only get two portions of the bar. And, you know, so you only get two attacks yeah. at once. And it's, it's a pain in the ass. But, like, it's also... <sighs> I like the, the idea of the free-flowing combat in a situation like that because it, it, it forces you to think quicker. Like, if you set it right on the original, which I love to play, but you can literally sit there and just, for an hour, if you wanted to, just stare at it and think, all right, if I do this, he'll do that. So if I use this, that, or the other, he'll, you know, here, you, you know, it's, you know, bam, bam, bam. You got to be quick. Which you know it works when you're when you're playing a game where you got to fight, you know, to oh, yeah. continue the quest. It's, so, it, but gotta, it's a different experience, so it gives you a reason to play the game. Yeah, and that's the whole point. Is that it's a different experience. If I wanted to just play the exact same Final Fantasy VII but with better graphics, I don't know that I that's even really worth my time because it doesn't add anything to it. If I have a, a I haven't even cracked them yet, but I have the uh, HD remasters of uh, Yakuza 3, 4, and 5. And my only concern, because supposedly they put back in all the uh, deleted content from the, when the games were uh, translated originally. But my only concern is one of my favorite things, and it sort of got dropped from the series after, I want to say after 3, was uh, they had these very specific environmental attacks where it was like, you could only execute this attack like on this particular level that you're not, you're only in one time during the game, you go into this particular building and you can do an attack where you kick a guy out of a window <laughs> or you jam his head into a, uh, a fan blade or something like that. Like there, there, there are uh, environmental attacks you could only perform certain times. And I feel like the series got away from that by four and I missed it. Like I was like, it was always really fun to sort of like go, oh, I have to go back to, I have to play the game again because there's a list of all the ones I need to hit. And I need to hit this one next time. So I have hundred percent. And it was like a worthwhile uh, achievement. Whereas I feel like a lot of the achievements in games, like the, you get all the Joker trophies in Arkham Asylum or Arkham City, you're a psychopath. I don't think I don't think you actually are a, like you're, there's something wrong with you if, if you I took was all that time. Locking something of note, like you know, I get I could get all the the skins and the whatever instead of right. buy them, I'd be down for it. But literally, you're just ramping up time played on the game by those. That that yeah. is a giant middle finger to me. It really is. Yeah. Um, we were uh, we were also we were talking about uh, Last of Us. Um, 
as well. Uh, I would love to talk about that because uh, that's that's another one where people are kind of divided on where the story is at now. Um, um, refresh me. You you have you've played both of them to their completion. I played the first one. I know the uh, I I've, I've completed the first one. I I know the story of the second one. So did okay. not play the second. All right. So in, in your opinion, uh, there are people calling for a third one because they want to see the, the the conclusion of this story. Uh, for those of you watching that haven't played it, spoiler alert. But to refresh everybody else, uh. Joel is killed and Ellie goes on a quest to find his killer and finds her and through a lot of uh, exposition discovers that revenge is not, you know, is not always for everyone. It's not palatable, but she still sticks it out. And uh, she's kind of left at a kind of a waypoint, a crossroads of what she wants to do with her life. And uh, you're kind of left to wonder. So people are assuming that there's going to be a third game. But some did not like the fact that Joel got got killed. Um, do you see a need for like a, a, a third chapter in that, or is it good as is? I don't think there is a need for a second chapter. I, I think the appeal of the story um, for the first game was so perfect that you couldn't add anything to it. I feel like they, if they wanted to tell another story in that world, that would be one thing. But trying to tell another story with Joel and Ellie, I thought was a mistake because it ended on that perfect sort of bittersweet question mark. Like, my, I'm going to sidebar here for something. I know I'm in the minority and I enjoyed it when I watched it, but I maintain that it would have been an amazing ending to Breaking Bad if they had ended it on the season four finale and not got done season five. So I haven't, I haven't, I, I'm, I'm a broken record here. I haven't finished uh, Breaking Bad. I think I'm still in season one. I started watching it during the, uh, okay. the during the, uh, the, for the lockdown and then things kind of opened up. Yeah. So I got to go outside of my house and, you know. I'll Simply put, the, uh, without spoiling anything, season four wraps everything up clean and happy-ish. There are a couple of questions left hanging, and I think the questions left hanging that ultimately get answered in season five are almost a better ending. I, I do think, to a certain extent, Seinfeld caused the problem because after Seinfeld's really shitty season fin or series finale, which I don't, don't think should have been a shock, it was a shitty show, but Seinfeld's shitty season for a series finale created this whole thing of first there was that, then you had The Sopranos with their shitty series finale. And then everyone was like, no, you need to tell us exactly what happens 100% to every character. Nothing can be left hanging, period. That's it. So, you know, and what we wound up with is they have to give this hard ending to, not just a hard ending, they got a hard ending and then a second movie, a movie to explain what happened to Jesse. Like they, they literally like, no, you have to know exactly what happened to every character so that we, we can call this officially done. And I, I think there, like something that was nice about the ending of The Last of Us is this idea that Joel experiences this horribly, horrible traumatic event in the beginning. Mm -hmm. He's faced with re -experience, or experiencing that again at the very end and opts to do monstrous things to prevent it. That final level, when you're running through the hospital, is one of the most intense video game experiences I've ever had. And you're not even doing anything. You're just running. But that final idea of like, will Ellie ever figure out what actually happened? Will Joel ever tell her that he killed all these good people because he did not want her to get hurt? Like, will any of this come out? That being left in the air, I think is amazing from a storytelling standpoint, because that is, that's a head scratcher. That's, a, that's one that makes you think, like, how do you feel about this? So let me throw this in there because this kind of dawned on me the other day. This, I mean, it may not be anything. It might be, but like mm -hmm. I had this thought in my head that, you know, Joel, you know, as you said, Joel does terrible things to keep Ellie alive in the face of potentially um, making sure that a, a vaccine is never created for that disease. And I was hit with this thought was it really that bad what he did what made life as we have it now what makes it so much better than what they have in that game outside of the pack of feral mutants trying to eat them 
that is equivocable to any disease that we have now already. We're just, you know, one pandemic away from, from annihilation. Something's always ready to wipe out life on this planet. That's the story of, of, this, of this planet as we know it. So, it, you know, my, my argument for is it really, is their world really that bad versus what we have is, you know, they have found a way to go on, what is it, like 20 some odd years uh, past the outbreak, right? You know, they're, you know, humanity has survived through through all of that. They, but look what they look what they're dealing with. They're dealing with religious sects that are that are out there trying to enforce their ideology. You've got government influences trying to wipe out people, killing at random. Uh, you've got infighting, but you've also got people just trying to to just live life and survive. It, it's almost a parallel to what we have now. The only difference is they don't have a, a large ruling body trying to tell everybody what to do. So it, it so I find myself kind of in my you know what was really lost. The issue is, is that what Joel did, if you're looking at it in the grand sense of him robbing them of the vaccine, that's not the point. The point is we can all agree the vaccine is a good thing. Yeah. Like that would be a good thing. We can all agree that the people trying, the fireflies, trying to develop the vaccine, are trying to do a good thing. Mm -hmm. And we can generally agree the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, which means Ellie's singular life is less valuable than the lives of literally every other human being on planet Earth combined. See, that that is, in my own personal moral compass, that is where I kind of stutter a little bit because... But this is the point, is, is that... Yeah, you know... Life is precious, but can we truly say, but if we say that Ellie's death saved 7 billion people, that's a pretty hard, pre like, now, then why I'm not was, talking about it. Why wasn't Ellie? So here's the thing. Opinion on the matter. That's the I, well, and therein lies the key is that she wasn't asked because it puts them in the awkward position that they have to deal with the no. To be perfectly, I'm not saying they're 100% morally, uh, Right. Released from any wrongdoing. What I'm saying is Joel's actual act had nothing to do with it. Like, I don't think the issue morally where the question comes up is about uh, the potential development of the vaccine. It's that he looked, instead of trying to reason with them, he looked at all these people and said, fuck you, you die. Yes. I would rather kill every single one of you than go through this shit again. And he even the the very at the very end I can't remember her name but when the la the last woman is begging for her life and she's like I won't come after you he goes yeah you will and he shoots her like <laughs> at that point point. he was like, have you seen the like it's like a live performance of certain scenes by the actors of of the I have uh, not go look this up because there's a there's an alternate ending that they included in the making of the game that they act oh, wow. out. It, you know, it's got Troy Baker and everybody it, and they act right. out the scenes and they do that, but they do the alternate ending where they sing the scene and it is freaking great. Like, go look that up. It's called uh, uh, A Night with the Last of Us or something like that, but it's, comple it's completely out there on YouTube and it is freaking yes. awesome. It is so good. All right, I'll look them up. But uh, yeah, like I, I find myself enthralled with that story of The Last of Us because kind of like with the Resident Evil, or not Resident Evil, with uh, The Walking Dead, it's that, you know, if you were forced into this person's shoes, how would you respond to the world around you, especially with, in, the, in the face of what they're facing? So I just wanted to get your, your thoughts on, on that because it's, it's, it was one of the bigger games in the last decade, both one and two. Well, I, and again, I, I think the the ending for one was so perfect and it did raise those questions of, of how, like, is this reasonable? And I think that's why the sequel was so poorly received by so many people, because there's nothing you could add to that first story. You could tell a different story with, if you want to tell a revenge story, you could have told a revenge story that happened in a million and one different contexts that had nothing to do with Joel or Ellie. Right. But there's also, I think that pressure when you do a sequel that you have to include something from the first game. And those characters were so well received. I I can't fault them for trying. I can fault them for rushing. And and that's maybe part of the problem is that sometimes you have to remember that it's better to do something right than to. And actually, oddly enough, it, this comes back to Resident Evil too. Um, was it Shinji Mikami? Was that the creator? Yeah. Yeah. He's notoriously fickle. 
Hmm. Like they'd finished, I want to say half of Resident Evil 2 originally before he said he didn't like it and scrapped the whole thing. <laughs> and they had to start over. There's like, I think you can find a, a ROM of it. It's called Resident Evil 1.5. Oh, and it's just a couple of playable. <laughs> it, yeah, but it's like a couple of playable levels that are just like an office building. And then he got the idea. He was like, "No, this is stupid. They shouldn't just have a police station in a normal office building. That's dumb. Like, we need to make this like you know, yeah. it needs to be different." I yeah, like... but but I, I think a lot of time game designers, especially, and you'll hear about the horror stories working in the gaming industry, um, are so pressured to just turn out a product so quickly that they forget that as video games become closer to, um, or becoming more and more viewed as art and similar to, it's an artistic form of expression the same way that film and television have become. I, I think we, we're gonna start realizing you can't rush a good game. You can't, like, as much as people wanna rush it, you really can't. When you rush a good game, you know, you get Fallout 76. <laughs> a game that's so broken, they have to, like, even the concept is broken. They that because they just wanted to make a new game, but I'm I'm a believer. Like one of the smartest things I ever saw, actually, uh, with video games, uh, the company that made the Yakuza games actually made a Fist of the North Star game. Okay, but they and they just had to change a few mechanics and add them to make it for Kenshiro and for the the Hokuto Ken style. But they already had ninety nine percent of the game made. Because they were just like, okay, we can take the program for this, the uh, the software that we basically made for this, and just reskin it and add new characters and a new environment. But it's all the same stuff we already have. We we're, we're not reusing assets, we're, but we're reusing the the basic uh, concepts. What is it? The, uh, well, not concepts. What is the oh. thing? Um, the engine. We're using the basic engine. Yes. So that to me is the smarter way. Like I would have rather seen a million games produced in the last of us world using that same engine or a similar game. Cause the last of us engine is very similar to the engine used for, uh, for, uh, what is it? Uh, uncharted territory, right? Or, yeah. yeah for uncharted. Yeah, uncharted. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would like to see, like, I, I feel like they're going to do something more with that last of us universe, but it, it is going to be something completely uh away from the the ellie and joel thing it'll be something that happens somewhere else in the country or in the world whatever yeah. which which would be fine i think it'll be something like open world where you can travel to other you know other other cities and things like that a little bit more freely than what they do where it's cutscene and things like that but uh yeah. one more thought on on video games as a whole because we spent a lot of time talking about video games which is fine because oh, yeah. like you say we're 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 not necessarily a podcast about pro wrestling um uh, it, we spent a lot of time talking about things that didn't work i want to talk about uh something that works that i found has has really worked and, and kind of enthralled me a little bit is it's it's games like uh outlast or alien isolation where the the idea isn't to to run through and destroy everything in your path it's 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 find a way through without being killed by the unkillable thing uh, i'm thinking specifically of course about um alien isolation have you had a chance to try games like that where it's more environmentally driven driven no not in a while at least uh the last one i played was probably on ps3 and i couldn't even tell you what it was called uh, it was a DLC. It was just a downloadable game, but mm -hmm. it was uh, think of it kind. It was a post-apocalyptic game, but it was more based around strategy and like uh, sneaking than it was around like action. Right. So it was. Uh, I, I like the idea of it, um, but that's basically just Metal Gear Solid. You know, that's yeah. Which I love Metal that, Gear I, Solid, but that got a little off the wall there towards the end. Yeah, but but again, as, as is the way. <laughs> um but I, I think a lot of kojima kojima is not known for being a uh a simple man he's not a he he's a bit out there but the, the idea is that i think of having games where you have to use more strategy and you have to really think your way through i don't think that's a bad thing i just for the most part it's, it's rare for me to come across one that i find interesting and it almost always has to have a deeper sort of connection to like something greater like metal gear solid was always an easy sell because i liked the series because it was so damn weird yeah and just I broke a lot of controllers on that first game just because I couldn't get out of the freaking uh, warehouse in the beginning of the game just to get to the elevator in the back. Oh my god, that game frustrated me at first. I, I will say Metal Gear Solid 3 is one of my favorite games of all time. 
it, yes i i think it i think it's probably the per- perfect metal gear game um it is. Right. I think they should have stopped at four, but that's not to say I don't have use for five. But um, I, I, I like that five closed the loop. That I did appreciate. Well, did it though? Because I feel like I feel like there is a space where you could go back and do Metal Gear and Metal Gear Two and retell that story and and get a couple more games out of it. Pardon me, out of it. Not to be materialistic, it's all about money at the end of the day for them. I think those games would sell. You'd get David Hayter back one more time, you know, two more times as Solid Snake, and you could kind of make that work towards the backdrop of what's out there now because that that whole like NES to PlayStation thing in terms of the story doesn't necessarily line up. But you know, there's stuff that they did on like the PS3 era and beyond that doesn't work either. But I would be excited for for Metal Gear and Metal Gear Two if they were to redo it. I don't think they will though because there's issues there, I believe. Uh, can you hang on for one second? Sure can. I just gotta. Hang on. I'm gonna pause. I'm. Okay, we'll we'll leave it on. Um. Oh yeah, I can still talk. I just had, yeah, to, yeah, I just yeah. had to get up and move real quick. Got you. Um. So, like Metal Gear. Like I know a lot of people kind of just roll their eyes at it. But I think Metal Gear was one of the more intellectually stimulating games to me it was like a like a like an anime come to life like it really was it it was like an anime and like an action movie rolled into one come to life where you got to be a part of it yeah well then that was the idea that was what kojima was going for and i I think a lot of time people tend to undersell the nature of what his goal was because it got so far out of pocket and I, i think the uh the struggle in many cases when you're doing something less conventional, which is what he was doing. It was a very unconventional way of telling a story and a very unconventional style of gameplay. I, I, you guys might not be old enough to remember playing Metal Gear Solid or the original Metal Gear for the first time and the sheer insanity of when do I get the gun? Because <laughs> as Americans, especially in the 80s, we were, we were unfamiliar with this idea of a video game, especially an army video game, which is what we saw it as, even though we didn't understand that. Right. Um, you didn't just go around shooting things. That idea was foreign to us. We really couldn't wrap our our heads around it. And I remember thinking the game was terrible for years because it never crossed my mind that there was another way we could be solving these issues, that there's another way we could be, you know, another solution to these uh, uh, challenges in the game. It just seemed like the game was too hard. I think that was the interpretation a lot of people had was the game is too hard um, and I don't know what to do. And especially on the NES, there was always that logic of sometimes a game would just be too hard and it really would just not make sense. And there wasn't a real solution. And it could be bad programming. It could be uh, someone just, you know, was lazily shoving a game out because they just needed to get something on the, on, the, on the shelves. There could be a million and one things that caused it. And there's no logical explanation. So we were so used to that, that when we uh, were faced with a game that was like, no, 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 this is the reason this is, it's not, you know, it's not laziness. It's something else. It's not just hard. It, it was a challenge. It was a challenge just to understand. And, and and going back to what I said about Metal Gear Solid, when I played it for the first time on PlayStation, it was, it was that exact mindset because you're so just conditioned that, you know, there's, you know, uh, button mashing, hack them and slash them, just destroy everything in your path. That when you get a game like this, where the idea it literally says on the box, stealth oriented, and, and whatever, just throw the box aside. I got the game. It, like you try to go through there and do that, you get caught the first time, and you know you're punched full of more holes than Swiss cheese within half a second. And you, you know, you're right. oh, when you when you get up the the first time, they they notice the uh, footprints and oh. started following them. I lost my mind <laughs> when you're in the snow. Yep. Yep. Oh, that yep. was such bullshit. Oh, it just drove it, 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 but it, it challenged you to change your 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 thought process a little bit and change the way you approached things. And I think that that's what makes a good video game is it, it's it either has to keep you enthralled the whole time, or it has to give you some sort of mental epiphany, or it's just got to be so wacky and crazy and goofy that you just can't help but just see where this is going. I think it's got to be one of those three things. You know, no game has to hit all three buttons, all three tiers, but it's got to hit at least one of them and, and, and 
to the nth degree. And I think Metal Gear Solid hits at least one of those. I think you could argue all three, but that's that's another topic for another day. Yeah. But um, we are closing in on <laughs> we've already almost done an hour already. That's that's insane. Are, are you good for a little bit more? Or, or you Oh, yeah, I'm good. for. I, I, I'm well aware I have if I have one truly terrible habit. It is that I like to talk. That's why we've been on we go. <laughs> Yeah, when you put me on a podcast, and I, I don't do interviews anymore. This is the first one I've done in quite a while. We're uh, honored. You know. Yeah, I, I, uh, I've, I've put a hard line in the sand. If a promoter doesn't specifically ask me to do one, or if it's unless it's for a friend or someone I know, I, I just won't do them. Uh, they got too repetitive and boring, and there were other issues that were coming up that were starting to enrage me and i was like you know what i'm just not going to do it anymore and that's fair like when we kind of set out to do this we we, we just kind of had this idea in the head you know let's pretend we're in a car for for an hour or so going to an arena you, you know you're on that car ride to the next show and you got to find a way to entertain yourself in the car with your friends so just do that it's you know we could talk about pro wrestling everybody talks about pro wrestling and they talk about how this can change in the business and why their idea. For well, they don't. That's the problem. If you want me to be perfectly blunt, the problem is no one talks about pro wrestling. They just ask the same fucking questions over and over again. So uh-huh. tell me how your career started. Tell me about this. Like, do you not have Google? Do you not have Wikipedia? Have you not yeah. listened to any of the 300 other interviews I've done? You're asking the same questions. Why are you wasting my time and yours? And I guess, if anything, the appeal of an interview nowadays for me, like one like this, is that we're not necessarily talking about anything else. We can just talk about, or we're not talking about anything that has been asked about before. Yeah, we're, we, we just let it rip. And, and that's, that's kind of why we do it, is we just want to be something different from the normal, something that anybody can throw on if they're, you know, at their nine to five driving around somewhere, or if they're, not, like I said, on their way to the show and they just want something to kill the, you know, to kill the dead space because, you know, everybody's just tired and they want something stupid to laugh at but i don't think we had anything stupid to laugh at today i think we got a little deeper than i have even envisioned and i love it like i could i could talk theory with you all day you know <laughs> oh yeah and again that's what i mean is that there, there's so much that people don't even get into when they talk about this stuff that it can be there's a lot of layers and a lot of levels to what you can get down to it's weirder that we will add depth to things that have no, zero depth and that when things actually have depth, we refuse to acknowledge it because we just think it's below us. It came up again today, actually. It was driving me crazy. Another one of these fucking dipshits did the whole, you know, Batman could do more to stop crime in Gotham if he just donated his money to charity. Ooh. So I'm a Which, nut. And- let, me, let me say something just right off the door. Number one, this, that statement assumes that Bruce Wayne has no philanthropic endeavors ever. That statement unto itself assumes that Bruce Wayne does not donate a large sum of his wealth and fortune to charity, which is inaccurate. Exactly. Secondly, it assumes that 100% of the crime he stops is street-level crime that is motivated purely by uh, financial necessity of impoverished people. What public work, what... What social program could Bruce Wayne donate to to stop Killer Croc from eating people? Yes. There isn't one. That's why he has the rogues gallery, because it's the days of Bruce Wayne beating up muggers are long gone. And that was because the character originally had very little thought put into it. That is a fact. We all, as a, as a, as a, as a species, we decided Batman was rebooted with Batman Year One, and that is the character as it's gone forth. Yeah, and it's not there haven't been other characters. You know, Norm Brayfogle, his whole run in the seventies, obviously. There, there have been other Batman like that, but that was when it was like, this is the hard reboot. This is Bruce Wayne, who's about bringing down the, uh, what is it, the Court of Owls? He's about bringing down the corruption within the system. He's trying to change the system, not just you know beating up right and this all came from the old the meme from like 10 years ago now the one about badly describe a movie and it's uh i love those i love uh, what was it a wealthy man refuses to deal with trauma chooses to beat to put on a costume and beat up homeless people instead like that's <laughs> that was what the birth of this whole idea was and it's insane to me that people really don't under like they think it's this deep thought of like that 
either the stuff Batman's stopping or that the reason he does it and other superhero TV shows, comic books, everything have all addressed this idea that I actually got kind of mad because I, I'm sure everyone on here has been enjoying Peacemaker thus far. Is everybody here watching Peacemaker? I haven't given a chance to watch it. I'm on Euphoria right now. That's that's the next one. God, there. why? Why are you watching Euphoria? I heard it was good, so I turned it on with my girlfriend, and it's just so again off the wall in what it's the just fuck yeah, it, on? it's I, someone it's somebody watched the movie Kids. And then they watched a couple episodes of Nip Tuck and said, I could push these two things together and <laughs> just do that. It's Nip Tuck kids. It's let's take oh. something that kind of maybe happened to one child or one teenager, and then we'll give them all the things. There, there is within this one. Go ahead. I said within this one tiny little friend group, and then we'll blow it out of proportion and start having weird stuff happen that makes no sense. There, there's an early uh, storyline that I found kind of fun, actually. Though it was uh, the, you know, the guy and the girl uh, were were on like a dating app or whatever, and like before that had happened, they like hated each other almost instantly. Like, and and they ended up matching on on like the grinder or whatever it was that they were. Yeah, playing. but you know where that goes, right? Yeah, I, I've seen where it's gone, but I, I like the concept. It, it went a completely different direction uh, than I had in my head, but I like the concept of two people that don't like each other end up matching on the on the dating app. And I personally have a theory about that. I don't know if it's been gone over this. I think he did it intentionally because he always had that plan because of the whole thing with his dad. Oh, that I know this is, we're talking really out of, yeah, we're really talking out of pocket here because if you haven't actually watched the show, none of what I said made sense. But my, my point is, is that Peacemaker uh just getting back to it damn i don't even remember what my point was we were, where were we we were talking about batman and then oh, you... oh, and, oh and peacemaker when peacemaker got popular thank you yeah um because they reveal in the series that his father is a straight-up white supremacist yes the white like it starts as a joke about him being racist and then they're like no 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 he your peacemaker's father is actually like a member of the ku klux klan and neo-nazis like an actual racist yeah. um this brought up an old quote from, uh, what's his face, from Alan Moore. And I love Alan Moore, but Alan Moore is hands down the, he got done dirty, don't get me wrong. He deserves his bitterness. He earned it. But he is the most bitter human being in history. I have never seen a human being who hated so thoroughly, not just his own work, but everyone else's work in a single genre. And I'm into pro wrestling, so I should tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> so... But about how he says that or he he'd said once that basically uh, a lot of the superhero tropes were rooted in white supremacy. And you can even look at like the cape and the mask and all this being similar to the way the Ku Klux Klan was portrayed in Birth of a Nation. And when I when I read that, my first thought was, yeah, because every single at this moment, every single Jewish person who was forced to work in comics because they were dirty Jews that couldn't write for proper books or magazines. It's just looking at him going, fuck you, pal. All right. <laughs> comic books were the first ones to call in the like comic book artists were actually the first people to call out Hitler. They were the first ones to go to bat for the the in mainstream media to go to bat for the civil rights movement. What the fuck do you think X-Men was about? <laughs> exactly. Oh, dude, I love that people are like when you tell them about X-Men. That oh, but it's like it's the it's like half these guys, like half the writers and authors and artists were Jews who were told they couldn't work in other fields. This is a fact. Then you had, again, black folks, women, that, uh, all these people, all these minority groups that were told basically they couldn't work in traditional media got their start in comics. So I just think it's a real fucking middle finger to all these motherfuckers who worked really goddamn hard and created some genuinely interesting and well thought out characters to just say, oh yeah, but you have a cape and Ku Klux Klan members wear a cape. Therefore you're both evil. Like you're fucking stupid, man. That's fucking bullshit. Um, going back to Batman real quick. Let me hit you with, with my spiel on Batman and why I think Batman's the biggest piece of shit in the entire universe of, of, of his. Batman perpetuates his own existence. He knowingly perpetuates his own existence. Those criminals that he catches, he turns over to the police who he knows cannot keep them behind bars. He knows they're going to escape and he keeps 
turning them over for that reason. Because if they keep getting out in his mind, there's a need for Batman. There will always be a need for Batman. And and you're wrong. I'm wrong. Okay. Go <laughs> for wrong. It. I can prove. I can disprove it. Now, it, it's not a great thing, but I will tell you the thing. Batman's an idealist. That's possibly his worst attribute. It, and it's ironic because you would think that he's this dark, brooding character who doesn't, you know, uh, doesn't connect emotionally to anything. And he just, it's the war and I'm here to solve crime and fix the problem. And the reality is Batman is very much an idealist. He truly believes people can change. Um, to, to pull a... Uh, uh, I think you, or I think you should leave quote because that is my favorite show. Uh, he's not a piece of shit anymore. Used to be, you know, <laughs> slick back hair, white bathing suit, sloppy steaks at Trafani's. Used to be a real piece of shit. But the point is, is that um, Batman's whole—that's the whole reason he doesn't kill people. Like, oh, it's because it makes me as bad as them. No, it's because he truly believes that people can change. He honestly believes that if he kills someone. He is saying they cannot change, and there is no hope. You could say it's – now, it's overly uh, optimistic. I will say that. And he's definitely put a lot of people in danger by doing that because legitimately, yes, he could just kill. But we also see the opposite side of how that goes with the Punisher because the Punisher is very much the near-mere reverse version of Batman. Like everything about Batman's story is in Punisher's story but reversed. Batman lost his parents when he was a child. Punisher lost his family when he was an adult. Batman was wealthy. Punisher was poor. Batman lived a life of privilege. Punisher was in the military. Batman chooses not to kill because he believes people deserve a second chance. Bat or Punisher believes, fuck these motherfuckers. They crossed the fucking line. They're fucking dead. <sighs> and it's just this very, this, this weird dichotomy of if you look at two characters, but the thing, but that's kind of the point is the Punisher is the idea that People can, people might be able to change, but some people can't. He is what happens when you accept killing is a, is a necessary evil, but he's also not trying to change the world. That's the weirdest part. The Punisher is absolutely not trying to fix anything. He's trying, he's punishing people. It's in the name. You know, it's, he's like, it's, yeah, you've it, committed this, unre this, un this unforgivable sin. So you get punished. Whereas Batman truly does, I think, and now I said, I'm not saying it's, a, it's the greatest idea in the world. I think Batman truly believes that if he gives the Joker enough chances, the Joker can change. And if the Joker changes, no one has an excuse. No criminal is beyond saving. And that means we just have to figure out the how. A lot of people die in the process. I no, like God, I fuck those people. Not a perfect house. theory. This guy's gonna change. Just you wait. <laughs> but I, I, I'm not like I said. But he's he's. I, it's it's the optimism that sells the character. I think that's why Batman is at his core so popular. I think it's because of all the superheroes, he is the most uh, hopeful. Superman straight up is like, I could kill all of you and you're really only doing what I say because you know that. He knows that. You know, every other superhero has such massive power that we're kind of forced to listen to them. Batman's the only one that has to reason with us. Everybody else can just go, like again, Superman could just go by force. Uh, that's actually what um, Injustice is about, if I'm not mistaken. What would happen if Superman just straight up forced his will on humanity? Jesus Christ, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, and he's doing it because he believes it's right. And there, there's even that discussion uh, where it's like, uh, where do you draw the line? Smoking cigarettes is bad for people. Do you murder people because they smoke? You know, like, where do you draw the line of morality? And I think the idea with Batman, is, it's why uh, Frank Miller saw the two as unable to coexist, because in his mind, Batman very much is someone who believes that change can occur. And Superman is someone that believes change can only be forced. You can't, like, and to a certain extent, as I said, I think it almost is reflective of the fact that Batman suffered this trauma as a child. He still has a very childlike way of dealing with his problems. Like that's universally understood. Yes. Putting on a costume and fighting people is a really silly way to handle your issues. But within that childlike idea ideology, he genuinely believes that people can change. And they and this is actually reflected a lot of time in the comics and the cartoons, where he will offer work to uh, former criminals to help them reform their lives, because the, his logic is if I do this. It's one less bad person out there. And again, he's not going to fix everybody. 
but he also knows if he admits that he can't fix any everybody, then it gives everybody an excuse to not get fixed. You couldn't fix the Joker, so clearly you can't fix me. Why don't you just kill me? I mean, every bit is bad, right? So it becomes so it's just this never-ending flow of the idea isn't perfect. Again, don't get me wrong. He absolutely has cost a lot of people in Gotham their lives because he's been unwilling to just do the, the ugly thing. But the logic will always be if he does the ugly thing, he's admitting that everything else he's done is bullshit. That's, yeah, I had that one loaded up. You were not ready for that. <laughs> yeah, I that was wow. That, that's actually that made me sit here and think, <laughs> like, oh shit, y'all, y'all, you don't want to see a dead body. <laughs> like, I got, uh, I got nothing. Like, you win. That was incredible. That was incredible. <laughs> that was thank you. I asked take a bow. <laughs> I I would, but you know. It's, oh right! I'm not a. I don't. I don't stand up. I. Ah, fair enough. Fair enough. Wrestling. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm just old, man. I just, oh god! Yeah. Every day, right? I, I joke with. Oh well, no. Here, here's a. Uh, here's a funny story. Just I was at the dentist a while back, and I was limping because I, I my knee had swollen up. You know, I've had both my ACL replaced. Oof. And I made a comment about being 39 and the dentist, the dental assistant was like, oh, you're not that old. You're only 39. It's not that old. And then she asked me about my knee and I said, oh yeah, I just, uh, my knee's swollen up. I've had my ACL replaced before. And she goes, oh, if you're considering getting knee replacement surgery, you just said I wasn't that fucking old two seconds ago. And now you want me to get my knee replaced? Like, do you not see the jump there? Oh God. Yeah. Just every day it's something new, you know, because I'm, I'm, 35 I, you know I, my best days are are probably behind me in terms of physical ability <laughs> but like you know shut up you, you i don't want to hear a peep out of you. <laughs> first of all word. <laughs> I, I i'm gonna say this i will say your best days are only behind you if you give up that is that is when they're behind you ah um jack lalane was still pretty well fit when he actually died and he was like 95 but I, 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 it's just, I think it becomes a whole deal of you have to be smarter with how you train as you get older. Um, but yeah, they're like the days of, you know, I, I, I'll tell people straight up, I don't deadlift more than 300 pounds. I don't think it's nice and they're, they're, doing stuff that. Well, that, that's why I'm like, I'm not going to wrestle anybody who weighs more than 300 pounds. And if you weigh more than 300 pounds, I ain't going to deadlift you. <laughs> I think it's a reasonable stance. Oh, like, like my knees hurt, you know, my back hurts, but like for whatever reason, it's like it's like that scene from from uh, Star Wars. Yoda throws the cane away, pulls the lightsaber, Rod does his deal, he's done. He picks the cane back up and he hurts. That's kind of where I am right now. Like I can still do the thing, but then after the thing, I pay for it. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you right now, you got to get in, get some yoga, get some yoga, change change your life. And, oh man, like I've got the DDP yoga loaded up in my computer. Don't do DDP yoga. Get pro- go to a proper yoga studio. You know why? What's that? And it's not a knock on DDP yoga. It's I'm gonna put this. If you have to get up and get dressed and get in your car and drive and get out of your car, go in the yoga studio, find your spot and put your mat down and wait. You're gonna do yoga. If you have DDP yoga loaded up on your computer, you can do it whenever, right? But that's the problem. You can do it whenever. It's not scheduled. It's not something you physically have to leave the house to do. Like my mom, uh, my mom does Zumba. Okay. Her, her second husband was from Peru. She learned how to salsa dance and all that stuff. Um, so my mom does Zumba now. That's like her, her choice of exercise. And when the studio, when the, because back in California, obviously, uh, a lot of the gyms and everything were shut down. When they opened up, she was right back to it. But when she was at home, it's like she could do a Zumba video, but it's just not the same, you know? Right. And I, I think people underestimate the same thing with home workouts. Home workouts are never the same as a gym workout, even if you have the equipment. If you're not that elite level of athlete who just has that drive, physically being in a place where you have to do it because you're there is a, is a great start. Just after that, it's all caffeine and, and self-deprecation. But, you know, the start <laughs> is just physically getting – but no, it, legitimately, that's if you get through the door, that's 90%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you can get through the door, that's 99% of it. And you get to the gym. I've, very, I've, there, I've definitely had days where I've left the gym fairly quickly. 
but they're very, they were extremely rare. It's been a while since I've had one of those where I'm just like, I'm just not feeling it today. I'm going to leave. But for the most part, I, I think the thing that really matters is just, tr- especially for a referee, because you guys, you don't necessarily have to look good, but you have to be physically active. Right. Um, so you have to be structurally sound, which is why I think things like yoga are such a good choice for them because it, it, it helps to strengthen your knees, your shoulders, your elbows, everything that you guys abuse the living shit out of. That Tommy Young slide will take, an, will take a toll on you eventually, you know? Ain't it the truth, right, Jesse? <laughs> uh, he doesn't. No comment. I refuse to. I refuse to do <laughs> you do it? You used to? I will not do it. I, I, take, I take more of the... Uh, more of the quiet approach. Jesse's the athletic one here. <laughs> oh, of course. There's always one in a duo, you know, there's always a dynamite kid to the, to the uh, Davy boy Smith, you know, yeah, I've, I've yep. been through this 14 years. I've only hyperextended an elbow. This man's had more surgeries than three football players combined, you know, well, I'll take my style. <laughs> I try to only crack out the crazy stuff for like special events now. Well, that, that's how you got to be. Is I, I, I remember I was trying to get actually English because um, he's surprisingly athletic. I don't think people realize how athletic he is. I tried to get him to do some of his crazier stuff on TV, and he's like, well, no, if I do it tonight, I got to do it every night. And I'm like, no, you don't. They can't force you. <laughs> they, they can't make you do it. Because <laughs> he, he legitimately could throw like a picture-perfect moonsault, 450, all that shit, because he, the dude was like a gymnast in high school which I don't think a lot of people realize that Matt was that athletic, but it was one of those, the, the, the logic he was brought in with was, if you do it on, if you do it tonight, you got to do it every night. And my whole thought is, no, you do not. You can't make me. <laughs> like I, if I hit, I can hit a 450, like Brock Lesnar could hit a shooting star press, but how many times do you see him do it? Once. Once. I mean, he almost killed himself that one time, but I was, but in OVW, he showed he could hit it regularly. And, but it's the idea of like, you can't, you don't need, no one can tell you what to do in your match. They can try, but you don't have to do it. Yep. So I, I think the idea of sparing your body is more about like, exactly it's about doing it smart when it's a big event and it matters. If you if you do it every night, then it doesn't matter. You become Teddy Hart, you know. You, yeah, you numb that, the audience to what you're capable of. And that's that was uh, one of my biggest problems. My first, I would say, ten years as a referee was that I wanted to just be that one energetic guy from start to finish. And I had really great people working with me, like Rudy Charles, who was like, nah, man, you don't don't need to do that. You need to save yourself. And I wasn't real smart about it. And fast forward several years, I've had to have surgery on both shoulders, my right knee. Um, I've just got lingering issues. And it's like, shit, I should have been a lot smarter when I was younger. And now, you know, being 17 years in, I'm kind of like, okay, I can be a really steady referee for these normal matches. But when it comes to like this big match that needs that enthusiasm, that's when I can step it up. I don't need to do this in the the very first match. So I think I'm a lot smarter about that. Well, again, it's about value. If you give it in every match, then it has no value because it's what's expected. You have to understand that the whole point of it's actually something that happened with WWE's production value. And this is just a personal gripe, but we'll just do an aside and talk about wrestling for like two seconds. <laughs> if, if you, if, if raw is three hours and SmackDown is three hours and your pay-per-views are three hours and you're seeing all the same matches you saw there on the pay-per-views and you're seeing all the same, like at what point, why is a special event valuable if it's all the same stuff you're seeing on TV right down to the line? Cause it used to be raw was two hours. Pay-per-view was two and a half hours. Raw had segments, uh, interviews and matches. Pay-per-view had some interviews, but they were all related directly to the matches that were happening that night. And then it was just matches. And there was this understanding that you were paying to see something special, something extra that you wouldn't get on a normal night. If you give me, um, I don't even know who's in WWE. So if you give me Roman Reigns versus Seth Rollins on Monday Night Raw for six minutes, and then you give me Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins on SmackDown again, I, I don't know if they're doing still doing the separate brands. I genuinely don't know. <laughs> but my point is, like, if you keep giving me the same the same thing, you know, on every TV show, why am I gonna? Why would I ever care about the special event? It's like, oh, I, I can see them have a longer match, okay, but then I should just watch this. Why am I watching TV leading up to this? 
especially when the pay-per-views all look the same now because they just use the exact same set with graphics instead of having the big elaborate sets like they used to. I yep. Which from a, bu- from a budgetary sense, I get, but come on, man, from a presentation sense. Yep. Well, it's, it's, that's one of the gripes that I have with one of the places I work right now. Um, we typically do, we'll take like two or three episodes each time we have a show uh, for IWTV. And the problem that I have, I had on this last show is that we had two hardcore matches where there were crazy weapons and crazy spots. Yes, there were two completely different episodes, but the crowd didn't react to them that well because we literally just gave them all the same thing in one night. And it's like, what? we need to save that stuff for like special events. We don't need to cram everything into one night. And I think well, that's, and that's the lot. Cr- yeah. I was gonna, I'm sorry, I was gonna, that's the curse of trying to do TV tapings is that if you're trying yeah. to do multiple episodes, you, you and it, you have to be smart about that story. We used to see it in NXT all the time where there was certain talent they would only use on one, one episode of taping because they knew the big reaction the big was always for their first appearance. Second appearance was less, so they would only use them once. Um, yep. In the same way, there were other talent they would use multiple times because they knew they could deliver great matches, but it was still limited because it was four matches in a row you might see. I think it was uh, uh, Pac, uh, Adrian Neville, where legitimately he did like four 16, pl- like 15 plus minute matches one on each episode, main events, where it was like him and I think Sami Zayn, him and Tyson Kidd, him and uh, maybe Tyler Breeze. I can't remember what it was. It was like leading up that NXT four way. He may have done three. Um, but it was just that feeling of like, Ben is amazing. Like, he's a phenom. He can do it. But there's also that part of me that goes from a taping standpoint, you're kind of burning the crowd out on him. Like you're really, even if the, the, the TV audience at home is fine, the live crowd audience is getting burned yeah. out because they've just seen him wrestle four matches. And I, that's something that we try to do. We try, like, if somebody's going to be on, we, we typically do three episodes. So we're like, if somebody's going to be on episode one, we don't want to put them on episode two, per se, with a match, but we want to put them on episode three so there's enough of a gap in between the live audience seeing the person. But again, my problem with these shotgun style tapings is that we're trying to cram all this stuff in and our times are curtain to curtain and it's it, it's just it's such a headache and i just I, I really wish we'd reformat to maybe taping two episodes per event that way we get more longevity out of the people the crowd the reactions and we save big things like the fans bring the weapons match or a uh, falls count anywhere match we save those for like once or twice a year rather than rehashing them like every three weeks, four weeks that we kind of done. And you, it, you lose the specialness of what's going on. Well, you know the rule in pro wrestling. If it worked once, we do it 50 more times until it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> yep, pretty much. <laughs> there, there, there's an old, there's an old uh, joke about how... Uh, a guy, a uh, pro wrestler starts to do steroids. He gets told, uh, take one, one CC once a week. You'll put on 20 pounds of muscle. And the wrestler goes, huh? Well, if one CC once a week gives me 20 pounds of muscle, how much would five CCs five times a week give me? That's like 100 pounds of muscle. Oh, man, I'm going to do that. And then they wonder why they dropped out of a heart attack at 33. Like, that's, yep. that we, it's, an, it's an industry of excess, and there's a bad habit of, not understanding the idea of sometimes having to pull back that level of excess. I, I still remember years ago, um, it was uh, CZW Unf and Believable, which was the uh, Jun Kasai, uh, it was Justice Payne and Johnny Cashmere against Jun Kasai and, geez, who was his partner? Maybe Gage, I'm not 100% sure. I don't 100% remember who uh, 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 Jun Kasai was tagging with. But it's the one where Junk Kasai got like a big chunk of his elbow taken out. Oh. Yeah, you know the one I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing that always stood out to me was after that wasn't even the main event. And the match that followed that was Lobo versus uh, Matt Man Pondo in a no rope barbed wire match. So you're following this fans bring the weapons match where a guy almost lost his arm with <laughs> a no rope barbed wire death match. And even then, I just remember thinking, and this was, you know, 20 plus years ago. This was 2001, I think. 
I just remember thinking that seemed excessive. Like that was, it wasn't like a deathmatch themed show. So having those two matches in a row seemed really excessive. But again, unfortunately, it, it's just something that comes up sometimes that people don't really consider that you can't, there is such a thing as overfeeding. There, there is absolutely yeah. a thing that happens with entertainment, with any entertainment, really. I mean, Rihanna's put out an album every single year she has been active. Every single year she's had a one new album at least. But that's insane. But it's also why people are more likely to talk about Rihanna's personal life than they ever talk about her music. They just sort of like accept her music is there and that she's a singer. But you don't ever really hear anyone talking about Rihanna's music. I can't. Because... Yeah, I can't remember the last time I, I like heard listened to her music and, and enjoyed it. But you know she's active. Like you don't think that she hasn't done an album yeah. in 10 years. Like but that's the whole point is that you'll you'll see this idea of people she's feeding the audience such a steady stream of uh content. As long as she puts out an album, it doesn't matter if it's good, it doesn't matter if it's bad, she just needs an album out because her built her audience is so built in now, they'll just buy it. It's like weird out, same thing. Weird Al would always get a gold or platinum album, depending on the quality. But ultimately, it was like Weird Al fans are going to buy it. So you're going to sell at least a million. He who is tired of Weird Al is tired of life. <laughs> that is a fact. God bless. So, uh, who's it? Uh, what is it? The kid that the uh, little Spider Man is supposed to be playing him in a movie, isn't he? Tom Holland. Tom Holland. I think Tom Holland's. It's either Tom Holland or uh, the guy that, or uh, Harry Potter. One of them is playing Weird Al in a biopic. Oh, uh, 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 Daniel Radcliffe. Daniel Radcliffe. It's one of them. Oh, wow. That, that's interesting. That's slightly terrifying either way because, like, that can go really good or it can go really bad. For I just like the idea that Daniel, Daniel Radcliffe really is he, him and it's like him, Snoop Dogg, and Shaq are at that point in life where they're just doing the side quest. Like, they've cleared the, the main mission all, already. It's just. <laughs> Whatever they feel like doing, they do have now. To care about anything ever again because financially they are set. Like I, I, every time I go, to, every time I go to the gym, I see Shaq in a different commercial selling a different product or service. I'm like, I don't think he cares. He's just like, put on a suit, get paid like thirty million dollars, and just talk about the general insurance. Okay, cool. So that kind of brings up a thought to my head. I, I've always said, like, if I won, like, the Mega Millions or whatever it is, like, that, that big Powerball, like, I'd change my name to Mr. Diaz. I would buy my own island, and you'd never see my fat ass again. What would you do if, if you won the big lottery thing, you know, the, the half a billion dollars or whatever it is that, that it gets up to sometimes? What would you do if tomorrow you woke up and you were just insanely beyond all reason wealthy? Like how would how would you how would you respond to that? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I think it's very easy. No, well, no, and legitimately. So I w grew up poor. I, I was poor pretty much my entire adult life. I I think the most money I ever earned before signing with WWE was I think seventeen thousand dollars a year. Okay. Um, my mom uh, was a school teacher, and after my dad went to jail, especially like our family was more or less financially destitute. We were pretty well in and out of various houses early on because uh, my dad's coke habit and gambling habit. Uh, well, things that are very expensive to have. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> cheap. yeah. So, so um, I never really had money until I got signed. And I remember when I got to the main roster and just that feeling of not having to think about a purchase before I made it. Like I didn't have to question if I had enough money in my bank account to buy a new video game or a uh, or anything like that. But I still didn't really like spending money that much. I, I still had that concern of like, I can't afford this or like that was still my mindset. Right. And I, I think that if you gave me that much money is particularly in that short a period of time, just imagine all of a sudden you have half a billion dollars I don't like I, it's one of those things where it sounds almost laughable when people when you hear people say that I just pay my bills off and you'll give some money to my family members. It seems stupid, right? It seems like silly, but you go, I'm not, I don't, ha I'm not a wealthy, I was never a wealthy enough person to have that wealthy person mindset. I don't want a fucking Rolex. I don't want a Rolls Royce. I don't want, you know, like the things that money could bring me, I like the security that that much money brings is really the the highlight of it honestly the idea of just not having to connor from the uh, ascension once said 
that his favorite thing, or like, he's like, you know what the great thing about this, this job is no matter what, no matter what I'm doing on TV, my wife never has to look at the right side of the menu when she orders in a restaurant anymore hmm. where the prices are listed. Basically. He's like, that was his mindset. He's like, when she goes to the restaurant, we order what we want. We don't have to look at the price. And he's like, that's a great feeling, wow. which legitimately it is when you, the first time you go to a restaurant in your adult life and you're not concerned with what the bill is, when you see the bill and it's like, you're, you know, you're tipping like 75 bucks because that's just 20%. Right. And it doesn't, you don't bat an eye at that. That's a great feeling. Admittedly, that level of security. And I maintain everyone should have that. That's I, the biggest mistake with capitalism is not understanding that it only functions if money is moving and money only moves with competence. If I'm guaranteed to make $100,000 this year, and next year and the year after that and every year until I die, I will spend $100,000 every year without batting an eye. And every penny I spend is a penny that goes to somebody else at their job, at their business, in their industry that keeps the economy moving because now all those people have money to go spend their $100,000. But the second you take away my confidence that I'm going to have that money, now I hold it. And now that money stops moving because I stop spending. So this whole idea of hoarding wealth, like Jeff Bezos having whatever $30 trillion he has right now, $30 billion, you can buy the world. It wealth. actually hurts the economy. Like the reality is if you want to improve the economy, raise minimum wage, raise like lower prices, raise minimum wage. That's how you do it. I mean, you can't forcibly lower prices, but you can put a cap on them. But raise minimum wage. That's how you, that's how you actually improve the economy. Because if people have confidence in their money and that they can spend it, they will. When people, that's how the stock market crashed originally. That was the first big stock market crash was caused by people having zero confidence in the banks, pulling all their money out at once and tanking the banks. That's what did it. Woof. It is just confidence. That's all it is. This whole, our whole existence, our whole society is bullshit. But that bullshit only stays together if we all have faith in it. So poverty robs you of your faith. And that's why people do terrible things when poor. Not to say people who are wealthy don't do terrible things. What I'm saying is that no one ever mugged somebody because they had the money. They could, they, you know, like a wealthy person doesn't commit, you know, gun in your face theft. You can ask Caleb about that. I'm sure he's been robbed gun in the face before. But <laughs> uh, he has, he's had a rough life. But, but the point is, is like there, there's always these cases of, it's why they say that pop, like the real motivator for most crime that we deal with in daily life is money. Yeah. And it's the, not only the lack of money, but the lack of confidence in your money. Again, people don't want to, if people think they're going to lose their job, they're less likely to spend. If people think their job's secure, they're more likely to spend. You know, and that's really, if the more people spend, the more the money moves, it's like a river. If you stop water flowing, what happens? It becomes stagnant. You get mosquitoes. Yeah, it dries up eventually. But if you keep the water flowing and moving around, it's always going to be there. So, yeah. That's my weird uh, socialist rant for the day. Hey, go for it. Like, no, no. Hey, and that, I was like, that legitimately makes the most sense because, you know, I've got a decent job and I have decent pay. It's not great, but I try to be frugal with my money to a degree, but I still try to have enjoyment because a lot of the crazy shit I have to deal with, I want to be able to like, well, I want to be able to spend my money and enjoy it. So I, you know, I grew up poor too. So like, I don't know what I would do if I had money. I would be, okay, my bills are paid. What do I do now? Yeah, oh, yeah. and that's kind of where the, uh, that's kind of where the, I think a lot of it ends for people. They don't really think about it beyond that because things like a, uh, again, you want to buy a Mercedes or a, a gold plated Rolls Royce, whatever crazy thing pops into your head that sounds neat, but the actual necessity or the function of it is really kind of like, do I, if I had that much money, do I want to leave my house so much that I need a nice car? <laughs> like, that's really the question yeah. I have to ask. I've never understood the idea of like having to go, you know, all right, I have this wealth, so I have to show it by, you know, buying the Mercedes, getting the gold watch. These are all things that you have to maintain and take care of and not let get destroyed. I've never seen the practicality in that that line of thought. Now I see buying the house, I see, you know, getting a, a, a butler or whatever, you know, to help maintain the place. I, that's practical to me. I've never understood needing to wear my wealth on, on my on my wrist or uh, like the Island Boys right now is a thing. They've got their teeth all encrusted in diamonds. I'm like, why, why is that necessary? 
Like, well, so here, I'll explain this. I'll explain both those things because they're not actually the same. So the thing with the Island Boys is they're fucking idiots. Yes. That's it. They're, they're, they're idiots who are trying to show their wealth, but their wealth is actually nothing. They're, first and foremost, if you don't have a jeweler in there checking it, no one knows those diamonds are real for the most part. So those could be complete bullshit. It's easy to get a stack of ones and put a hundred on the top and then pretend like you're fucking balling. But in fact, you've got like $800 there. It isn't that much money. So again, don't trust them. They're con artists. But with most wealth affectations or, or, uh, or uh, little, you know, shall we say trinkets, a watch, a Mont Blanc pen, these things are signals to other wealthy people that you're in the club. That's all they are. And the fact, because they, they, a, a Mont Blanc pen isn't going to write a marked amount better than a Bic, than a little ballpoint Bic that costs you 29 cents. <laughs> but the point is to show you have so much wealth, you could spend $1,500 on a pen and other wealthy people will recognize it. Poor people won't. Poor people won't get it. It's like a hard, like they've, they've done the study. They said there's a marginally different uh, level of education you receive at an Ivy League college versus a like community college. You know why? Because facts don't change. Two plus two is four, whether you learn that in, you know, Sonoma State University in Santa Rosa, California, or you learn that in Harvard. Hmm. What you're paying for is the branding of Harvard University because other wealthy people who've gone to Harvard will see Harvard on your resume and go, oh, you're one of us. Uh, that's, how they, that's how the money keeps going back to the rich people. It's not because they're smarter. It's because they know how to recognize other rich people. Yeah. And they know they're in the club. And if you're in the club, all of a sudden you're not paying for anything. Why? Because you don't have to pay. You're already rich. Exactly. <laughs> that... That actually makes yeah. a sense. Holy crap, man, we are doing it today. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that, that's what I do. I bring the heat. I love it. I love it. Um, unfortunately, uh, I got to wrap this up on my end because um, I am going to go work the corporate wheel tonight and see what kind of money I can make doing the Uber Eats on Super Bowl Sunday. Oh. I, I just have this theory it's going to be a good night because it's the Super Bowl. So I've unfortunately got to bail out on this. Uh, we would love to have you back though at some point in the future because this this was, uh, absolutely man. This was easily one of the best two hours I've spent in a while. But uh, Jesse, before we get out of here, uh, do you have any words of wisdom for us? Like always. Yes, always. Remember, no adding to the population, no subtracting from the population, and please do not be the reason why I have to lose my voice at a safety briefing on Monday. <laughs> absolutely so with that being said this is the crew of pop goes the zebra wishing everybody on earth a good night and we will see you next time simon thank you for joining us and uh we hope to have Not you back problem. in the future always Bye.